Coordination complexes are some of the most structurally complicated molecules we've looked at so far. To help us make sense of some of this structural complexity and help us more easily compare related molecules, we can use the concept of isomerism. And isomerism is really important both because it allows us to relate molecules to one another and because it helps us organize levels of structure. Isomers are defined as compounds that have the same number and type of atoms, that is the same molecular formula, but different arrangements of those constituent atoms. The Nobel Prize winning chemist Roald Hoffman describes isomers as the same and not the same. Isomers are the same in that they have the same molecular formula. On the level of structure that corresponds to the numbers and types of atoms within the molecule, isomers are the same. But on a different structural level, a more complex structural level we might say, isomers are not the same. They differ, for example, in how the atoms are connected to one another or their positions in three-dimensional space. Thinking about the ways in which molecules can differ gives us a conceptual framework for thinking about molecular structure and its different levels. So at the highest level we have what we might call composition. This is the number and types of atoms within the structure and it's captured most succinctly by the molecular formula. Molecules that differ in molecular formula are just completely different structures that bear very little relationship to one another. Molecules with the same molecular formula may differ in how the atoms are connected to one another and this is what we call the constitution of the molecule. Constitution is the connectivity of the atoms and is represented most succinctly by the Lewis structure. Finally, even molecules with the same connections between atoms can differ in the three-dimensional placement of those atoms in space. This is what we call the configuration of the molecule. This is most succinctly represented in a three-dimensional Lewis structure that shows where the atoms are located in space. These two different levels of structure, constitution and configuration, are associated with two different types of isomers, which we'll talk about in this video. One other point I want to make about isomers before moving forward is that isomerism is a relationship. I harp on this when I teach organic chemistry because it's very easy to call a single molecule an isomer. But we have to understand that isomerism is a relationship between two molecules involving a comparison and a recognition of what's different between the two molecules. We can draw an analogy between the different isomeric relationships that exist between molecules and, for example, familial relationships in an extended family. So, for example, we can talk about the relationship between a husband and a wife as one type of familial relationship. We can also talk about the relationship between a child and his father, for example, or his mother. These different types of familial relationships are analogous to the different types of isomeric relationships that we see between molecules. A key point here is that just as we need both, for example, a father and a son to talk about a father-son relationship, we need two molecules to talk about the different types of isomeric relationships as well. So as we just talked about, there are two major classes of isomers that correspond to these two levels of structure. Constitutional isomers are identical in their composition. They have identical molecular formulas, but they differ in the connections between atoms. They have different looking Lewis structures, you can think of it that way. Constitutional isomers are more similar to each other than are molecules with different molecular formulas, but a second class of isomer has identical constitution. That is, the atoms are connected in the same way, but the atoms are arranged differently in three-dimensional space. And these are called stereoisomers or configurational isomers, evoking that very specific level of structure configuration, which is the three-dimensional positions of the atoms in space. Stereoisomers tend to be more similar to one another even than constitutional isomers because the connections between the atoms are the same, and the difference in the three-dimensional structure is a relatively subtle difference. Here's a flowchart from your text that helps us organize isomers mentally. So we can break down isomeric relationships into two types based on the two levels of structure. We have constitutional isomers differing in constitution and stereoisomers differing in configuration. Within constitutional isomers in a coordination chemistry context, we're going to talk about two subclasses. 
linkage isomers, which have a specific constitutional difference, and ionization isomers, which also have their own distinct constitutional difference. Within stereoisomers, there are two very broad, very important classes to appreciate. Diastereomers, which have different positions of the atoms in three-dimensional space and are not mirror images. We're going to talk about in a separate video why this mirror image consideration is important. The other class is enantiomers, which have different configurations. They're stereoisomers, but they are mirror images of one another, and that has very important implications for structure and properties for the two molecules under comparison. We're going to focus in this video on the constitutional or structural isomers, and the first type are called linkage isomers. Linkage isomers share a relationship where a ligand bonded to the metal that has multiple donor atoms is bonded in different ways to the metal center in the two molecules. So, for example, take a look at the two complexes shown here. We have the same molecular formula in both. You can verify this yourself. We have five NH3 ligands, a cobalt atom, and an NO2 ligand. And so the molecular formulas are the same and the overall charges are the same. So we know that these are isomers of some kind since they share a molecular formula. The two molecules differ in how the atoms are connected to one another. That's how we know they're constitutional isomers. In one molecule, there's a cobalt oxygen bond to the NO2 ligand, and in the other molecule, there is a cobalt nitrogen bond to that same ligand. If we consider the NO2 fragment on its own, we'll see that this molecule has multiple donor atoms. The negatively charged, formally at least, oxygen atom can serve as a donor, or the central nitrogen atom can serve as a donor. This leads to two possible linkage isomers, one in which the oxygen is bonded, that's the blue molecule on the left, and the other in which the nitrogen is bonded, that's the black molecule on the right. Ligands such as NO2-, which have this ability to bond through multiple different donor atoms, are called ambidentate. We want to distinguish that with bidentate. Bidentate means a molecule has two binding sites. Ambidentate means that a monodentate ligand can bond through multiple possible donor atoms. When determining the isomeric relationship between two given structures like this, to identify linkage isomers, look for an ambidentate ligand in the structure that's bonded in two different ways to the metal center. In a previous video where we introduced ligands, we talked about this idea that a counterion, and especially an anionic counterion, can potentially serve as a ligand, so it's important when we write molecular formulas in text form to use square brackets to distinguish what's actually coordinately covalently bonded to what's only ionically bonded to the complex. Ionization isomers are constitutional isomers based on this idea that an anion can serve either as a ligand or a counterion. So ionization isomers differ in the anion that's bonded to the metal ion. Two examples are shown for us here. In this blue complex on the left, we've got a cobalt 3 plus ion, five ammonia ligands, and an SO4 2 minus anion, as well as a Br minus anion. The sulfate here is actually coordinately covalently bonded to the cobalt 3 center. So if we were to write a molecular formula for this, we would include, of course, the cobalt 3 and the five ammonia ligands, along with the sulfate anion, all within the square brackets, and we would include Br minus outside of the square brackets to indicate that it's just a counterion. But of course, bromide has lone pairs of its own that can coordinately covalently bond to the metal and displace the sulfate anion. And if that happens, we generate the black isomer on the right in which the coordinate covalent bond between cobalt and oxygen to the sulfate ligand has been replaced by a cobalt bromine coordinate covalent bond. Since a new ligand has entered the coordination sphere, but the overall molecular formula has not changed, verify especially that the charges work out the same and that all of the same atoms are present. These are constitutional isomers of one another, and they're ionization isomers. We can write a molecular formula here of, again, CO and the five ammonia ligands. Now, bromine is actually within the coordination sphere of the metal. It's within the metal complex, and so we want to include it in the square brackets, and SO4 finds its way outside of the square brackets since in this isomer it's merely a counterion. The key difference between these two structures is the different coordinate covalent bond within the complex. On the left we've got a bond from sulfate to cobalt and on the right we've got a bond from bromide to cobalt. 
when identifying the isomeric relationship between two structures, to identify ionization isomers, look for a new ligand entering the coordination sphere and one of the old ligands or a ligand that existed in the other compound serving as a counter ion.